Joanna has quite a fabulous background and does lots and lots of things. She has a degree in psychology, a master's degree in metaphysical counseling, a practitioner's counseling license, and a minister's license. She's been a life coach addressing personal happiness, creativity, and relationships for 12 years. She is also, what she's talking about today, the author of The Debt-Free Spending Plan. We have that book at the Pasadena Public Library, and you can imagine it's very, very popular, so it's checked out, so I don't have one to show you today. But I do have her book, How to Be an Artist Without Losing Your Mind, Your Shirt, or Your Creative Compass. We have that in the Pasadena Public Library. And we also have her brand new book, Stay With Me, Wisconsin, a book of short stories. She has a fourth book that she's going to be um, showing you and talking about too. Um, so she'll be talking about that one. But in addition to all of this, she teaches yoga. So um, she's very, very busy. And we're just exceptionally lucky to be able to spend some time with her today. And she's going to be talking about her journey to be an author, as well as probably interjected with everything else she does. So if you look at this beautiful room, I understand these paintings are Joanna's. So welcome, Joanna. Thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. It's really a great honor. So first of all, I must say that my husband has been on the library board in Burlingame for, I want to say, 10 or 12 years and also on the foundation um, here. And he curates all the donated books uh, for sale and they raise quite a bit of money for programs at the library. So we are huge library people. I wrote a large part of all four of these books sitting upstairs in the Burlingame Public Library. So, so the library is dear to our hearts. And even my mother-in-law who passed away uh, at 99 last year was on the library board for years. So, so thank you for having me. It's a great honor. And I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about the creative process because I think, um, my husband was a creative writing instructor for many years at the community college and also a film history professor. And he says this great thing that inside each of us is a story, right? That all of us have stories. And sometimes when I think about it, if I think about it through the lens of what we endure as human beings, sometimes I'm amazed that we're walking around, you know, the things we move through in our childhoods and our adulthoods and uh, the challenges or the hardships that are given us. And so when I think about writing, when I think about what I've tried to do in the world with my writing, the kernel of what I'm doing is in that quest of how do we live with the challenges we're given? Or if I say, if I was God, if I was the deity of the universe, I would make it easier, right? Because life is hard. And so I think um, one of the things I was doing with the nonfiction books was speaking to those things that we don't get taught as kids to ready us for adulthood. So the Dead Free Spending Plan was my first book. I had no desire on the planet to write a book about debt. It was just something I got in trouble with personally when uh, a number of years ago, and now I've been living debt free for, I wanna say 15 years, but I got in trouble with debt uh, because of my creativity. It wasn't to go to Tahiti. It was that I wanted to buy myself time. I didn't want a day job life. I wanted this other creative life. And so I got into trouble with that. I created this plan because I realized all my creative friends, a lot of them were in the same boat. I created a five minute a day plan because I realized even though I'm really smart and other people are really smart who are in debt, that we had about a five minute bandwidth for this topic in our life. And so I needed to come up with something that would get my head in my finances five minutes a day, solve it and be done for that day. And so that's what I did. And I sat down to write this book. I had no idea if I would have anything to say or if it would come out well. I just sat down one hour a day by the timer, four days a week. 
So I wrote Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, one hour. Took me a little over a year and a half to write the book. So one of the things I want to say to people who are longing to do something creative, uh, start a baby clothes business, write a play, learn to sing, whatever it is, is that one of the things I had to learn is I was a person who wanted things to come in all or nothing events. I wanted fast success. I wanted monetary results and I wanted it to happen quickly. And the big thing I learned when I learned how to live debt free, and this was the pivot in my life, was to learn to take slow, steady steps. To stop thinking in this very American thought process that if I make a music CD, that it should be an instant multimillionaire success and I should instantly be catapulted to a place where I could buy a house with cash in California. Right? <laughs> so that led me into the How to Be an Artist book. Because after I wrote the debt book, I realized, wow, I need, I need a message that's more specific to creative entrepreneurial people. And that was this book. And I'll tell you a funny story. When I was halfway through the debt book, I went to see this um, very intense, kind of crazy French therapist. And I said, I'm really pissed. I don't know if anybody's going to publish this. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And he said, why pissed? Why pissed? Just do the work as it comes. Just do it. Just do it, do it, do it, do it. Right? And I said, <laughs> and I said, oh my God, he's right. I'm like totally putting the cart before the horse. I'm, I'm not giving voice to my voice by expecting what I'm doing to come out in a, a perfect, a polished way. So I'll give you another example of that. We don't expect the two-year-old to do 10-year-old math, but often we do that with our creativity. We expect the two-year-old inspired project to behave like a 10-year-old career. And so I had to back myself down off that fence and learn how to put in my time, right? And putting in my time was the, became the joy right? Now, you know, I've got four published books and all of them have been published by publishers. I chose not to self-publish. And it's a huge amount of work, no matter which direction you go. But the building of a career creatively is slow and steady. So I also had to learn something else. I had to have a day job I could live with. And oftentimes in my life, I have had day jobs that I needed and I was miserable and I didn't want to be there. And so I made sometimes enemies out of my co-workers or made myself miserable in my head. And so I had to learn to be of service in a day job situation that would support me. A friend of mine said, wouldn't you like someone to come along and support you while you do your creativity, while you paint and sing and write books? And I said, yeah, I would love it. And she said, great, that's your boss, right? <laughs> and that was such a good awakening to show up humbly and available and also to choose something where there were good people there. It didn't need to be, my day job didn't need to be some um, magnificent thing. It could be something simple that supported me where people were kind. So the third book I wrote in the nonfiction uh, realm is called Naked Marriage. So I came to see this series, the debt book, the art book, and the Naked Marriage book as what I call my shortcuts to happiness series. All of them focus on five minute a day skills, right? short, sweet skills where we can get in and get out on a regular basis. So when we think of creativity, sometimes we think, oh, well, I'll wait for in inspiration to strike and I'll write for six hours, but then we don't write for another three weeks. The muses don't find us unless we show up on a regular basis. And what am I doing that's so crazy hellbent important that I can't put in four hours a week, right? And so those skills I applied to the um, challenge of in a marriage, having long-term intimacy, that idea that we don't want our intimacy to drop off, that we don't want to live in roommate-itis, right? We want to keep our closeness. And how do we do that in short, sweet intervals? So, um, so after I did those three books, I said, okay, I really want to get 
I kind of look at my life sometimes as a target, right? I want to get closer and closer and closer to the heart of what's really true for me. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I don't choose between my artistry. The same therapist, the same French therapist said to me, you're multi-talented, set up your life like school, your day job, a little painting, a little singing, a little writing. And as you do that, you put in a little bit of time over the course of six months, you'll get a lot done in multiple areas. Now, for me, that's really important. It's fulfilling for me to leave it all on the field. So I began writing fiction. Um, I took a class and a uh, writing course at Stanford University, and I met some other folks there who were terrific writers, and we started a writing group. And, uh, and this book, uh, Stay With Me, Wisconsin, which is, I'm hugely, hugely proud of, um, came out from a small press called Coyote Point Press. Um, and it's a story, it's, it's a collection of Midwestern stories, 11 short stories. And so um, I've been asked before, um, why do you write fiction? You know, what's valuable about writing fiction? And I think, it, for me, it speaks to my soul, right? It speaks to what it is to be a human being in a different way than nonfiction. I wrote my nonfiction books and I really had to argue for this with all three of my editors. I did not want to come at my nonfiction books from the perspective of an expert. Here I am, the doctor. Here I am, the master degree person. And I'm going to tell you what's wrong and what you should do. I wrote all of my nonfiction books from the pronoun we. When we get ourselves into debt, when we find our relationship uh, drifting apart, right? So it's basically the, the, the places where I fell down in my life, right? Those places from my humanity, I wrote those books. So when I came to write fiction, fiction was really the touch points of my life, right? The things that were, oh, here's my husband. Come say hi, darling. It's the Pasadena Library. So this is my husband, Mike, who's on the library board. Stick your head in here, darling. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I, can't, I can't see you, but I know there's somebody out there. <laughs> anyway, um, so when I came, when it came time to write fiction, first of all, I mean, you know, I really lucked out because I have someone who's a terrific writer in my home, my husband, who taught writing for many years. And so he really prompted me many times when I was writing the short stories to say, yeah, I don't think you flushed out this relationship enough. I think you need to go back and give us some more moments between these two people. In particular, there's a story called Green Leaf about a man who loses his family in, a, in, a, in an accident and he falls for a 27 year old, or, or he falls for a woman who's 27 years older than him. And the unraveling of that relationship and how they came to accept what was happening in love, um, that was really, really an important uh, unfolding. And so my husband coming to me and saying, you need to flush this out, right? I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that I have that at home. Um, but, you know, you can create that in a writer's group or sharing it with friends, etc. But the, the heart of fiction for me is about our flawed humanity, right? Our frailty, the, the things that we have to overcome, the things that are thrown our way that we don't see coming. And there's a, there's a message, I don't know what that is. Um, hang on just a second. One of my other phones is going off. Let's just be human here and, oh, I know what that is. That's, <laughs> that's my alarm that's supposed to remind me to stop working <laughs> at 5.15. <laughs> anyway, this whole idea that fiction speaks to the delicacy of our hearts, the things that get dropped in our laps that form us as human beings, but often that we don't see coming or they get dropped in our laps and we have absolutely no idea from the place of heart, spirit, or intelligence how to feel what just landed in our laps. But somehow we do. And that's the arc of what's interesting to me about writing fiction is 
the the healing, the opening, the loving, the finding, the searching, even the anger, right? And the loss. Like I wrote uh, a story from a first person point of view about a guy who's an Everest climbing team photographer and filmer, uh, film, what do you call it? Uh, I don't know, I'll think of the word in a minute. But at any rate, he's on this journey, this amazing journey in the mountains of Everest but he's losing his marriage at the same time, right? And so someone asked me, you know, how do you come up with all these ideas? And uh, there's a very funny story. There's a guy locally who, who does a, a, a podcast for the Historical Society here in Burlingame. And uh, there's a street in town called Bayswater. And, he's, and one of my characters is named Ponty Bayswater. And the first story in the book chronicles his life from world war ii till he's 91 and uh, he said how'd you come up with that story and i said well i was sitting at the stoplight and i said who was bayswater what who, who got named you know who why did they name this street after bayswater and i thought well what if he came back from the war and the second world war and what if he had this amazing relationship with this woman and what if he was half jewish and the woman he was marrying her family didn't want her her to marry him and what if they have this amazing love affair and then later I'm not going to tell you what happens some big turn in his life happens that's completely surprising to him but it's all about love and acceptance and in the meantime when he's a kid he had this uh aunt Violet who just talked to him frankly about love and sex right he was a short small little kid who got beat up all the time. And so he would come home when he was 12 and she would talk to him and say, no euphemisms. We're gonna tell the thing like it is, right? And then that plays out later in his life. Uh, I don't tend to write short, short stories, right? There's a whole movement now of flash fiction. And you know, one of my pet peeves in life is when I'm submitting fiction to a literary journal Oftentimes they don't want to see anything longer than 3000 words. And I want to say, come on, you guys are the ones who were supposed to read. But there's a movement towards these, you know, 500 word stories, 1000 word stories, 3000 word stories. My stories have much more of an arc to them. They uh, take you through a beginning, middle and an end. And I figure if I'm going to take someone on a, a 20, 15, 20 page story. I want them to know what they got at the end. I want them to have a sense of the arc of the thing. I don't want a, a really oblique ending. Uh, I want an ending where you know where you went, right? You absolutely know where you went. So um, what else do I wanna say? In terms of accomplishment, I'll just talk a little bit about the writing process. So the writing process has gotten harder and harder. I'm just gonna be really frank. If you wanna publish your own book, self-publish, no problem. You go ahead and write what you wanna write. I, I would lovingly suggest if you're thinking of doing that to get yourself a professional editor because there's lots of self, there's lots of self-published work out there that is under edited, let's put it that way. And to put out a book that you've spent a lot of time on, you want someone, in my opinion, to take a look at it, help you with grammar errors, point of view errors, um, just normal things that happen as you're writing a book. Um, that said, I didn't really want that route. I wanted to get published by a publisher. And since my first book got published in 2012 and now, it's just gotten a lot more competitive gotten harder to get an agent. One person who's um, who I know who does book seminars said, with fiction, don't even bother with the big ones. Go to the small presses, which there are tons of, but sometimes the small presses won't even look at your work unless you pay for a contest. You know, so, so you can't let that stuff stop you. Um, I can't remember who it was. Was it Isadora Duncan or was it, I can't remember who it was, but someone said, Yes, it's hard. Yes, it is. It is hard. So what? Do it anyway. <laughs> right? And so that speaks to a, a larger issue of 
I believe, and this is true for me, I don't know if it's true for everyone, but I believe that if I don't get the stuff out in, that's, that I'm pregnant with, that's the stuff that's inside me out, if I don't get it out, my life starts to tank in weird ways. I start to get angry. I start to get pissed at my day job. I start to get irritated with my husband. I start to get mad at the world and the world's politics. And I know that now, that the arc of that, when I start to get agitated at the outside world, that there's an inside job, that that means that I need to turn and say, okay, what am I avoiding? What do I need to do next? What am I sitting on my hands about? Because the other part about being a creative person is it's not like being a dentist. Go to school, you're a dentist, and you retire, right? And that's the arc of your life or the arc of your career, I won't say your life. An artist, a creative person, our life goes like this, right? Our projects go like this. Here, we're in the creative process. Here, we're taking it out in the world. I'll just say in, in a book realm, right? We're taking it out in the world. Now I'm marketing it, marketing it, marketing it. And now that the arc of that is going down and now I got to create a new thing. And so that feeling of needing to start over again is with us very often as creative people. And so... Those, those obstacles that come our way. I, I have a, a counselor, a coach who I work with, and she says, don't spend a lot of time at the level of the problem. Jump over that and feel into or see, visualize, vision, sense, what it is that you're delivering to the world, right? Or I had a favorite, um, one of our dear friends is Sam Woodhouse, who ran the San Diego Repertory and founded it for 40 years. And his mom was a very spiritual person. And she, I'd call her up, right? And she would say, Joanna, just see the faces of the people who your work is going to touch. And so when people write me a text message or they find my email on my website, and they send me a little email and say, hey, you know, this book made me think about things completely differently. Or I just got one the other day. I was so depressed about money and I read your book. Now I feel hopeful. Or, um, you know, I was a, an old friend of mine sent me a, an email that said I was on my way to the Frankfurt Book Fair and I stayed up all night on the plane reading your book. I was supposed to sleep, but I couldn't put it down. Right. Those moments, th that, those are the reasons that we write or, you know, that's the uplifting. So I cut all the, I print those, I cut them all out. I paste in those messages inside a closet door. And I look at that whenever I'm feeling bummed out, right? Or whenever I'm, you know, on the, you know, 49th submission to my next agent, right? <laughs> you know? So, um, <clears throat> So how do I wanna wrap up these last five minutes? Um, first of all, I wanna encourage the people who want to do something creative and it doesn't have to be writing, it can be anything creative, to just take a step, slow, think slow, steady steps, one step after the other. And I do this thing, uh, cause I coach younger artists and I really, older and younger, but I really like to, coach people who are in their 20s who are trying to figure out what next steps to take. And I say, you know, I use this idea called hot tracks. Here's the center of my creativity. And I think, oh, well, this would be fun. This might be good. This might be good. Well, and then I start to take a walk down that path. And if the path goes cold, I have to have the courage to not keep banging ahead. Meaning if it goes cold in my heart, not that it's that there are obstacles, but if it goes cold on me in my heart, I need to turn around, come back to the center, the heart of my creativity and say, okay, let's try something else. So we don't really have a society that lets us do that, right? We don't have a lot of permission to go out and explore. We're supposed to choose and work and retire, right? So you have, we have to, as creative people, rethink that whole process and allow ourselves, like when we were kids, to go out and say, all right, let me see, let me play. I tried taking tennis lessons because I thought it would be cool. Didn't care, could have cared less. Started playing pickleball, love it, right? So follow the love, 
go where the love is. That's really what I want to say. And in terms of finding a way to map out your time, this book, How to Be an Artist, will help you do that. This is not a book about, it is a book about creative motivation in general, like The Artist's Way is, right? That's the famous book about creative motivation. But this is a book will, that will help you live with the tasks and the steps of the how-to, not just, oh, let's focus on our creativity, but here's how. We're going to learn how to do a time map. We're going to learn how to have buffer times. We're going to learn how, what if everything goes to hell one week and we wanted to give ourselves four, four hours? What do we do? How do we come, become accountable to ourselves? So I really want to say to the people who have some creativity living in them that they're, it's just kind of nagging at them to give yourself the dignity of sitting down, use a timer, sit yourself down for an hour, four days a week, three days a week, five days a week, no more, and just begin. And then in terms of the, uh, the whole idea of the fiction world, Stay With Me Wisconsin, this idea that we have an inner life and that inner life is valuable and that whatever we put down on the page or the canvas or it comes out of our voice or on a stage or even on a, in a meditation, a walking meditation when we're taking a walk, but that inner life is valuable. And so we look to our own frailty, our own stumblings, our own joys, our own loves, and value them as part of our human experience. Taking those vulnerabilities into every encounter we have, right? I really notice that since I've been writing fiction, I'm really interested in other people's stories, even if I'm just standing in the drugstore line talking to somebody, right? That that ability to go out from ourselves because we've allowed ourselves our own humanity and our own vulnerability, that that's a really rich thing that we capture in fiction. I certainly tried to capture it and stay with me, Wisconsin. Um, so I think I will wrap up with that. That's, uh, that's a good amount of information. <laughs> and then Christine, um, I will go ahead and let you begin questioning whatever questions you have. Thank you so much, Joanna, for such a fabulous presentation. And I want to tell you, it was so exciting to hear um, that you're such a library supporter for so many years and your mother-in-law was and your husband is and um, that you have, um, sounds like you have a bookstore at the Burlingame Public Library that um, your friends support. And we do at Pasadena Public Library too, and they raise money and, su and support our children's and uh, our various programs. So um, thank you so much for being part of that. And um, you've had just such a wonderful creative career. Um, how did you actually, when did you start your, this creative? Did you, um, your family, your parents, you had I'm a not, wonderful teacher? Uh, uh, you just, my, you, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so my, my parents were very musical. Um, I think my parents uh, were very young when they had me. My mom was 18. Um, and then uh, she remarried. She divorced my birth father and remarried uh, my stepdad, who I was raised with. And he was two years older. And they were both incredibly musical. So my mother played classical piano and my dad played accordion, sax, and guitar. My mother played guitar. I had three siblings. We all played an instrument. I played drums. My sisters played clarinet and flute. And my brother played guitar. So we had a lot of music in the house. Um, we went to a church where we sang a cappella. So uh, we, I learned to sing, but mostly I learned from the music of my parents, which was Linda Ronstadt and you know, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young and Joni Mitchell. And that's where I learned to sing. And it's also, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, Christine, where your creativity gets sparked and how. I mean, even though all that was in our house, my parents had were small business people and they didn't know how to nurture an artistic person, not themselves and not us. You know, there was a, there was a, a party line in our house that if you became an artist, you would be poor and your relationships would suffer, right? So that, and the culture has that belief as well, right? So 
that was something that it took me decades to overcome. You know, that was part of my debt issue yeah. is that I, all I wanted was to be left alone to do my creativity and see where it would take me. But in these all or nothing event swings, I wasn't giving myself the support, the day job, and the, dis the, the four hours a week or the st slow steady steps to get there. So you ask me, it, were there teachers? Yes, there were a lot of teachers. Uh, my art teacher in high school, I'm still close with to this day, sculpting, painting, everything to do with art. Uh, write, my writing instructors for sure. Um, and it was, uh, let me think, it was probably, uh, yeah, it was, it was my, I guess my sophomore year, I was on the speech team and I wrote poetry and read it competitively and I won a lot of medals and, and it was one of my teachers who introduced me to a poet who lived in Key West, Florida with his wife and two kids. And I went to visit them after I graduated and I saw this whole other way of living and that whole arc of doing that appears in my new novel called The Road to Key West, which I'm now submitting right now. But that whole idea that you could live in a, we lived in Wisconsin at the time, um, that you can live in a cold, small-minded, small town place and then go to this other place and see this bohemian, artistic, artists on the street, um, very fluid kind of life. And so I was lucky in some ways that, that I fell into, if you want to say, or followed the path of certain events that led me to pay attention to a different lifestyle than what I was raised with. Does that answer your question? Oh, absolutely. So tell us about your, your new book. You use your creative um, talent and everything absolutely that you do. But let me back up a little bit. So you're, you're currently teaching yoga yes. and, then, and you're currently writing a book right now that you've just submitted to an agent. Um, and you're well, still Let me back you up there. Sorry to interrupt. So the way it works is if you want your, so I have had two agents. My last one just retired from uh, submitting fiction. Um, so now I'm looking for a new agent and that process you go for, you, you submit your book to an agent. If you're looking for the for someone to submit your books to the big publishers and the boutique publishers, mostly New York publishers. If you want, uh, if you want it, it's a little bit easier. If you want to submit directly, you can submit to small presses, which I'm also doing. And if you want to self-publish, you can go over here and self-publish. So it's three different tiers of how to publish, right? So right now I'm in the submissions process and I'm submitting to some very reputable uh, small presses and some agents looking for new representation. And the agent's job is to take the new book to the publishers and sell it to them. Whoa, you, you really, it's, it's quite a long process for you too. And do you just um, keep in contact with all of the agents because each agent probably is promoting a different type of book. So your nonfiction books are probably with one agent and your fiction book is with another agent. That's exactly so, right. That's exactly yeah. right. Um, but, you know, the whole nature of this is back to that quote, it's hard. Yes, it is. It's hard. Okay, do it anyway. <laughs> you know? I mean, you have moments, right? I do. I mean, I have, I have four published books and a fifth on the way. And I definitely have days when I just have to get away from the computer box, close it, and go get an ice cream cone, you know, like enough already. You know? <laughs> Well, I, yes, so of all the things required of, of you and your work, what gives you all that energy that you have? Because absolutely, you have lots and lots of energy. And I'm sure everybody that's listening to this, of course, this is being recorded. And thank you so much for allowing us to do it. And it will be on YouTube Pasadena Library. So everybody's going to want to say, I want some of that energy that Joanna has. How do I get that energy? Well, I can't, sort of came in the back door of that because I never, you know, there are lots of people who go to school and they knew they wanted to be a writer and they moved to New York and they wrote for magazines and they wrote their first book. I wasn't that person. I, I, it, it, 
it found me in a certain way. I was a grant writer for a number of years. And even that, I worked for a nonprofit when I graduated from college. And I realized, huh, I can write these grant proposals. And then I figured out that if I did that, I could work from my apartment and not have to go into an office. And that was like, oh, right. So I could manage my own time better. <clears throat> so that's kind of where I got my writing chops, right? You have to deliver 10 proposals in a month. There's not a lot of time for messing around. There's deadlines. You have to do it. And it's, I was good at that in school too. I liked that. I liked writing and I liked, I liked writing a paper and delivering it. It was always hard, but. But anyway, all that to say that the, that how that sparked into something creative was I had jobs that weren't working out in my heart. I was miserable, right? I hated them. I didn't want to go. Sunday night would come around and I'd start to get really anxious. And the reason was because every time I was, I don't know, where whatever job I had, I felt like I was wasting my time. And if I ask myself, well, what did I really want to be doing? There were these things in me that wanted to come out. And I hadn't been able to give myself the room because I thought you had to have a trust fund or I thought somebody else had to support me. And I didn't know the principles that I put down in the debt book and I put down in the How to Be an Artist book, which is get yourself a day job you can live with and start, start taking steps. Start walking the path. See if it still feels warm. You say you want to write a play? Okay, let's sit down, figure it out. Let's go online one day and say, okay, what's the format of a play? What do I have to include? Okay, well, that might be a day's work. And then I start to begin to see if I have something. What I find for me is if I have a sparked idea and I give it room, the story will always be there for me. Now that's kind of a gift, I think, from the heavens. You know, like the, the story will come. I'll be able to craft it. It doesn't fall apart on me. But I also have learned to listen. You know, like it, you know, a story will come in a flash for me. Like there's a, a story that I really love uh, in, the, in the Stay With Me Wisconsin book. I love them all, but there's a story called Fishing. And it's about a woman whose husband, she's in her 40s. Her husband has just left her three days ago. And I said to myself, okay, let me put myself, there's lots of stuff about people losing a partner, but I wanted to dive into the days right after. She's not washed her hair. She's not changed her clothes. She wakes up automatically at 4.30 in the morning to put the coffee pot on for him and realizes he's gone. She doesn't drink coffee. Right. So that's about the spark that I had. And so if I if I allow and permit my humanity to go out and play and forage and draw from the experiences that I've had on the planet myself, that I experienced through my friends and begin to craft a human story, I find great joy in that. That's like a really uh superb way to spend my time that is fulfilling to my soul it's fulfilling to me when I paint a painting I don't do as much of the painting now because I'm working really hard on the books and you know I do laugh with a girlfriend of mine who's also a designer and a, a jewelry designer and she has all kinds of entrepreneurial artistic things going on like me and we say oh you know <clears throat> it's Joanna Inc right <laughs> you know I'm like my own little you know, professional entity, hers too. Michelle Flynn is her name and she has a candle business now, right? And she's she does everything for her business. And so you say to yourself, but even though it's hard, I would 10 times more want to do this than be in an office being a marketing director. I could be a great marketing director. I could be a great spokesperson for a, you know, a political campaign. I could do lots of things. But this is the thing, no matter how hard it is, that I feel most proud of and most connected to. Well, there is that saying that if you love what you do, work will never bother you or will never be a part of your life. And so you really need to find what you love and you've absolutely done it. And then it's really not work to you. 
you just get up every day and able to do what you what you want to do. So do you find your yoga as a as a release or a different um, part or you're, you're teaching inspiration to other people in that class? Because you're yeah, probably definitely. chatting too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, uh, first of all, it's an antidote to what I do in terms of that it's physical. But I do, I, I, I do, I say, uh, I give what I call a little sermonette at the beginning of the class. Like today I was talking about something, my counselor's working with me. When you're dealing with a challenge, sit still, create some space around it, meaning you can't solve the problem at the level of the problem. So creating some space, allowing yourself to sit, allowing yourself to just gently come back to whatever it is you're dealing with, right? As opposed to something I like to do all the time is elbow through, you know, if I think I, sometimes if I hit it harder that, you know, it'll work faster and that's not necessarily the case. So yes, I do share that stuff with uh, my yoga and Pilates students. Um, I like it just because, well, let me put it this way. I told my husband when I stopped grant writing that I am eight times more satisfied showing someone how to stand on their head than I was when I got somebody an $800,000 grant, right? Like the, the way I'm improving their lives feels more humble and simpler, but it's very, very uh, huge in my heart. It reverberates in their life. People come to me, they bring me cookies, they bring me cards, they bring me flowers. That didn't happen in my old job. You know? They're, or they'll come to me and say, oh my God, I happened today. Oh my God, I came in here with a horrible backache. I now feel fine. I go back to my desk. I feel great. You know, that's, that's a huge gift to be able to do that and to be able to go there, do it and leave it. Right. And then come back to this thing that's hard. Um, but I do want to say something about the whole idea about do what you love. Cause we, right after, uh, I want to say sometime in the nineties, um, that Bill Moyer series with Joseph Campbell, he did that whole thing on do what you love, right? Do what you love. Right. And, and we colloquialized that in a phrase that everybody lived by for a long time that went like this, do what you love and the money will follow. The real truth of that is do what you love, get a day job or get paid a, a wage that you can live on live within your means, build on that slowly and steadily, and slowly, yes, you will build a career. What many of us heard was, do what you love and the money will follow. I'll front myself $50,000 on my credit cards to fund my music CD because I'm doing what I love. The money's absolutely going to follow. And then we put ourselves behind the eight ball, and then that year-old project is being asked to perform like a 10 year old project, right? That, that analogy you were using before about expecting the two year old to do 10 year old math. We put so much money pressure on our budding creative things, entrepreneurial uh, uh, efforts that we squash the very spark that we're trying to generate. So you can't swallow that pill. You cannot drink that Kool-Aid that says, if I just do what I love, the money's going to come. We don't know. It's not, again, it's not like being a dentist or a marketing director. I can't just say, <clears throat> okay, I decided to design baby clothes and I put all this money into it and I ran up my credit cards and now it's going to happen just because I did something that I loved. That's not the case. It's not an A to B to C. It's more like this, right? So it's really important that we keep our perspective and keep it, if, if, that, if that business needs to be in our kitchen for another year, that's okay. We want to not put the pressure of weird things on top of our creativity or we will kill it, right? We want to encourage it. We're raising a child here. Our creativity is a child that we are raising to stand on its own two feet. That is wonderful advice for everyone. Yes, really to take your time, realize what you want to do and realize that it's going to take you into steps. It's not just like you, the analogy of a child. Child isn't going to go from two to 10 overnight. 
um, with their with their knowledge and their ability. So you're just giving everyone fabulous, fabulous advice and what to do. Um, so when they listen to your YouTube presentation, everybody's going to get a lots of wonderful information. So are you a life coach to a lot of people? Do you do that too? Because yeah, I mean, I've been doing that. yeah, I have. I've been doing that for quite a long time. Um, I'm available to do that if people are looking for that. Um, I've done it across all three nonfiction books. So sometimes people come to me for um, to learn how to use a debt-free spending plan, and then it will become very clear that they really need to chat about doing something more creative in their life or their intimacy issues will come up around the money. Or so, it's, so that's one of the reasons one, after I had written the, the money book that I wrote the other two, because I realized that all these things are interconnected. Or I, I have another way of saying it in my debt book, you know, debt will kill your sex life, right? <laughs> so debt will kill your creative life. Debt will kill your intimacy, right? And so, so the whole idea of these things being interrelated, this idea of being able to nurture our, our intimacy with ourself, with our creativity, with our frail humanity, with the way we support ourselves, with the people that we're intimate with, right? That's, that's, that's what I work on in coaching. Well, you give a lot of wonderful advice to everyone, absolutely. And so your whole life series, um, series is really something that probably everyone should get a copy of it, um, all three of those books, and um, they're intertwined. And when you want to be a creative person or just anybody, if you're not, people that aren't creative like you are um, with your writing and your painting can mm -hmm. still learn a lot from your life lesson books. And yeah. um, you really can. And we have all three of them in the Pasadena Public Library that you can check out. They're also available at the Romans Bookstore in Pasadena to purchase if you want your own copy and go through, as you said, it's kind of in five minute segments a day. So if you take those and then practice it, um, your um, philosophy is kind of like do things, you know, one hour a day. Mm -hmm. um, you write one hour a day, you, you want to learn something new, you do it one hour a day and eventually, those hours, um, it's four hours in a, a week and 20 hours in a month, and it just kind of multiplies. And, and there you have just gained all this knowledge and um, you feel so much better and you're freer and your creativity kind of flows. Definitely, definitely. I'm going to uh, step over and turn on the light. We're losing the light here just a bit, so we're going to give ourselves a little bit more light. Um, so what, what is your favorite thing to do when, when you... Um, so you have everything planned. I hear that your clock went off to told, tell you it was five fifteen. So that's when you stop it. Okay? <laughs> you get up. You get up early in the morning and well, like that one hour. Yeah. Or? My husband says this great thing. He says, as a writer, as a creative person, as an artist, if you get up and do it first thing in the morning, you've built the pyramids already. No one can take it from you. No matter what shitstorm, pardon my French, what comes your way, no matter what goes to hell in a handbasket, you are golden because you've already invested your time in the things that are meaningful to you, right? So I didn't do that for years. I, I, I did some in the morning, then I would come back after a class and I would do some in the afternoon. I'm now at a place in my life where I know that if I sit down or if I want to sit down, that I will, right? There was a time in my life when I had to work my procrastination into the arc of what I was doing. So I always talk about this, that, you know, my covers would get clean, my refrigerator would get scrubbed, right? <laughs> but but I, the way I work, the way I finally learned to do it is I said, okay, if I'm giving myself four hours, and um, everything tanks and I have to take my neighbor to the hospital and I miss my time three days in a row. I still owe myself those four hours before midnight on Sunday. And that's how I made myself accountable. 
So in the How to Be an Artist book, I talk a lot about time and I talk about buffer zones. So you look, you take a, you can do it on a cocktail napkin. Okay, I'm, I've got a day job working as a administrative assistant for the, for the elementary school. I got to pick up my kids. I've got date night with my husband on Friday. When can I put these four hours in and where can I place the buffer zones? And then you got to train yourself and your family and your loved ones not to bug you. And the way to do that, to turn off your phone, shut the door, don't listen to notifications. I do not have notifications on my phone. I turn them off when I'm working, right? Turn them off. The sky won't fall. No one will die most of the time, right? I mean, if someone's on their deathbed, obviously you might wanna leave it on. But that said, it's okay to take the time. And by the way, no one's going to give it to you. You have to stand up against all the forces that want to take it from you and say, I will have this hour. I will take it. And as you begin to do that, you'll get stronger at it. It's like learning to have a voice in a relationship, right? You've been quiet and you haven't spoken up and then you slowly start to do it or having a voice at all. I mean, I trained myself how to have a better voice to advocate for myself by just being doing it at the cleaners and at the drugstore. Excuse me, you stepped in front of me there. I'm going to keep my place in line. Or, you know what? You left a, a, a solution stain on this. Could you fix it instead of taking it home, right? Just small steps that you can take out in the world to have a voice and to take the time that you're setting aside for yourself, which is the thing that's going to make you feel connected. And it's not just, you know, like you said, Christine, it's not just people who are um, artists in the traditional sense of the word. Like I make this distinction in how to be an artist. Uh, think of an artist in a much broader sense, a person who has a, 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 a blogging gig, a person who um, is a catering assistant, a person who is, it doesn't have to be a painter or a singer or a stage actor. It can be anything in the creative or entrepreneurial realm. So I bet you're a good cook too. I am a really good cook, I have to say. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you're just very creative. And so you want to try all those new, um, new cookbooks, those new recipes, the new spices. Um, well, my parents were restaurateurs and, and so there was a lot of cooking in our house in general, but you know, it was 1970s, 19, early 1980s cooking, which changed a lot, you know, things got, my mom was a really good cook and my dad was a good cook, but it was uh, kind of traditional cooking. And I, really it's my husband taking me out to dinner that's made me able to just go, oh, I can do that. And this, this particular realm is really a gift from the universe because I didn't study. It just, I can just go look at it and go, oh, I can do that. I can figure out how to make that date bread or I can figure out how to make that cake or I, that's a gift. Absolutely a gift. Well, I think your whole life is a gift, your creativity <laughs> and, and your ability to be able to decide that you needed to change and find it. And, and then all of your, one, your education led to it and everything that you learned and your teachers. So well, I think that if I had it to do over again, I would have gone to school for art. I would have gone and gotten a fine arts degree or a writing degree. I got a psychology degree because my parents' marriage fell apart and I needed to figure out why people did what they did. Or I had to write them off. You know, I had to say, okay, you guys are nuts. I don't want anything to do with you. Or, oh, okay, here's your humanity. Let me see if I can understand this. Now that's come back around to me in my fiction because in Stay With Me, Wisconsin, all the characters are flawed or hurting or overcoming or discovering or in love or all those things that happen upon us, through us and to us that we often don't have a complete grip on while it's happening to us, right? right. And so the, the psychology has helped me a lot and just just life, Christine. I mean, you know, you're on the planet for a certain amount of years. You make your own mistakes. You fall apart in your. Well, I have a very good story. My husband 
and I were together for a number of years, almost 10. We divorced, we separated, we were apart for more than 10 and we got back together and married each other again, right? Well, you can't do that unless you do something different <laughs> the second time, right? And we're very happy. But, you know, the arc of that was a very rocky road. And so you say, or a, let's just say a very illuminating and challenging road. But all of that then shows up in, in the fiction, in the painting that you're painting, in the, you know, mural art, in the singing that you're doing. I had a really great acting coach years ago. Um, so I was an actor for about 10 years when I was younger. And she said, everything you've ever gone through will get used for good in a creative life, right? And so the idea of connecting ourselves to the heart of our creativity, even if the heart of our creativity is how we raise our kids, right? Because oftentimes we don't think of those things as a creative life. What bigger gift can you leave the world than healthy, well-launched children? I mean, that's like a huge thing in the world. Uh, and a little aside on that, I have a friend who's, um, who is a, uh, a performer, and her, one of her parents got in her face once and said, oh, you're selfish for doing that. And I said, okay, well, let's take that apart. Let's think about that for a moment. You're standing on stage. The whole idea of being on stage is the arc of a stage play is usually characters, challenged, something works, something falls apart, something works, something bigger falls apart, and the person has to find the strength and the will to find their way through, right? Or there's this beautiful um, American poet named Charlie Smith and he says, the way out is through. And that's just a beautiful thought process for a, for a life. So the idea that whatever we're doing creatively is lifting up the people around us. What higher calling could we have? Or as my husband says, your job as an artist is to invite all the people around you to pause and feel into what it is to be human and alive in our time. Well, that is wonderful advice. And just like William Wordsworth said, we are part and parcel of all of our past. We just, um, we keep growing and moving on and gaining. And you've certainly um, gained and used, um, that's not really the right word either but um, you've just grown exceptionally and you've offered so much wonderful advice um, to everyone that wants to be a writer, that looks for inspiration in their writing, looks for inspiration in their daily life. And I thank you very much for telling us all about it today and being part of the Authors and Their Journey series at the Pasadena Public Library. It's been a wonderful um, afternoon. Um, so somebody um, wants to thank you too, the, our, um, live, is this our acting library director, Tim McDonald wants to thank you very much for your inspiring program because that's what today has really been full of inspiration. And I thank you so much for giving us that gift today. It's it absolutely ab wonderful. Absolutely, and my pleasure to be with you today, Christine and Tim and Tiffany, thank you so much. And to everyone who's watching step-by-step, Steady steps. Thanks so much for having me. Still well, thank, thank you very much for joining us today. And I encourage everyone to check out your books from the Pasadena Public Library and read them and gain more inspiration from them. So thank you so much, Joanna. We'll look forward to having you back for all your other books because I know you're just not going to have just one. <laughs> I'm going to be writing several more. <laughs> Thank you very, very All much. All right. Good night. Thanks so Good much. Night. For Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.